Shalom dear friends, after having seen the rectification of the covenant on Mount Sinai, the author takes us to the ark and different furnishings and the dress of the priest and the vessels associated with the temple in Jerusalem. That takes us to chapter 25. Yahweh's earthly dwelling uh, is borrowed from the ancient uh, traditions of the Canaanite culture. El is the head of the Canaanite pantheon. So he sets up a tent on a mountain where um, he has issued authoritative decrees or oracle. Now Moses is instructed to make a copy of the tent on the mountain. The earthly dwelling is based on the heavenly model. The biblical author employs uh, two names. First, the tent of uh, meeting, chapter 40-34 and the dwelling. Yahweh will take up a permanent abode in the midst of his people, modeled after the Jerusalem temple. This is a portable sanctuary. A tent is similar to the tents of the people of Israel during they stay in the wilderness. It is similar to the ancient Bedouin tribes that carried a small sacred tent made of red leather called Kuba. This is actually a pre-Islamic tent shrine. The, during the journeys such tribes could experience the presence of their gods. The plan of the ark is described in chapter 25 verses 10 to 22. The ark as you read from the uh, text is uh, a rectangular wooden cabinet four feet long, two and a half feet wide, two and a half feet high that contains the stone tablets given to Moses by Yahweh in verses 16 and 21. Hence, the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of the Testimony in the ancient Near Eastern common practice is to deposit treaties in a sacred place with a view to reading them in stipulated times. Here we have um, 
um, two sacred stones in the ark you know of the total 195 times where the ark is mentioned in the bible it is used 82 times with the divine name ark of uh, yahweh some 40 times ark of the covenant the ark accompanied the israelites from sinai to the land of israel after the settlement it was lodged in the temple at shiloa according to joshua chapter 18 verse 1 during the wars that israel undertook the ark was taken to the battlefield as a sign of god's presence they were convinced that god would fight for them but in first samuel chapter 4 the ark was captured by the philistines when the philistines returned the ark to the uh, to israel it was housed at a place called beth shemesh first samuel chapter 7 it had a house at kiriath yerim um, it was King David who transferred it finally to Jerusalem, to the city of David. Uh, he placed it in a tent that was pitched there. And Solomon, after the construction of the temple, placed this ark in the Holy of Holies, beneath the outspoken spread wings of the cherubim we have the detail in chapter first kings chapter 8 6 to 7 now some people regard this ark as the footstool of the invisible enthroned deity first chronicles chapter 28 verse 2 the ark has a propitiatory flanked by two cherubim two uh, like bodyguard angels the propitiatory is the good play is the gold plate on top of the ark that is associated with the divine forgiveness like the mercy seat from here Yahweh can speak to Moses and thus through Moses to the Israelites the same word kippur meaning atonement a metaphor for the word to clean to purge that's why the most sacred feast of the jewish people yom kippur day of the a day of atonement it implies a place where the deity cleanses the sins of the priest and the people now once this ark reached the promised land it served as Yahweh's throne or footstool what about this cherubim plural cherubs cherubim they are lesser deities in the Canaanite culture borrowed from the neighbors of Israel this cherubim provided protection for the throne, replenished every Sabbath and reserved to the priest. This is a reminder. The ark is a reminder of God's covenant with the twelve tribes of Israel. We move to the next uh, article, chapter 25. 23 to 40. Uh, it's about the table and the menorah. Two items. First, the table is to be constructed in chapter um, 23 to 30 with gold and 
equipment for being carried as well as an accompanying set of uh, dishes verses 23 to 29 the table on which the show bread was set out was portable like the ark with the carrying poles permanently attached the table contains the show bread verse 30 it consists of 12 loaves of unleavened bread in leviticus chapter 4 5 to 8 you shall take fine flour and bake 12 loaves from it two ten, uh, tens of an ephah shall be in each loaf and you shall set them in two piles see 12 in two piles six in a pile and six in another pile on the table so it's a table is made of pure gold and you shall put pure frankincense on each pile that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion as food offered to the Lord now an instruction is given to Aaron every Sabbath Aaron shall arrange this bread before the Lord on a regular basis and this is for the people of Israel a covenant so this show bread on the table is a reminder of God's covenant with the 12 tribes of Israel this is a memorial in Israel gifts were continually set before Yahweh to emphasize that the covenant lasts forever. These 12 huge loaves were arranged each Sabbath, as I mentioned in Leviticus, in two rows on the table, consumed after their display by the priest. Uh, we move to next item, menorah or the lampstand. This is elaborately described in chapter 25, 31 to 40. This is a candelabrum that holds seven lamps. Today the term menorah is used for one of the best known symbols of Judaism the seven branched candelabrum this also is a reminder of God's covenant with people the temple's menorah is commemorated in the Jewish tradition by the seven branched menorah lit for the Jewish holiday of the feast of Hanukkah the festival of light menorah has branches blossoms and petals all of which suggest the image of a plant or a tree which is popular in Israel menorah according to chapter 27 of Exodus served as an eternal light symbol of eternal light symbol of God's eternal presence its seven branches may have evoked the seven heavenly bodies perhaps untested as the hose the armies of the Lord the divine assembly of uh, angelic powers the lampstand seemed to have symbolized the fertility that comes from God. 
No, Solomon's temple had ten different lampstands in Second Kings chapter seven verse forty-nine. Um, now we move to chapter twenty-six, the sanctuary. Uh, we have a detailed account of the the pattern of the tabernacle, the sanctuary. This accounts, this account in chapter twenty-six, blends the ancient tradition of the tent of meeting in chapter thirty-three, and the later view of the structure and adornments. of the temple of solomon which will be seen in first kings chapter 6 ezekiel chapters 40 to 43 hence this is called the tabernacle of the tent of meeting the items um, in chapter 25 are to be housed in the structure mandated in the sanctuary from the second millennium a uh, site of mari to the modern uh, bedouin culture large tents have been used for sacred purposes the sanctuary um, the tabernacle is a portable tent half the size of solomon's temple if you compare with the first kings chapter 6 the place for the divine presence from the time of uh, hebrew exodus through the conquering of the land of uh, canaan its elements were made part of the final temple built by solomon in uh, jerusalem the english word tabernacle is derived from the latin word tabernaculum meaning tent tent tabernaculum is itself a uh, diminutive of the word taberna um, which means uh, hut or booth or uh, tavern uh, there are wooden frames that form rectangle rectangular building that is approximately 45 feet long uh, 15 feet uh, wide and 15 feet uh, high and it is open on the east there are sheets of finely woven materials that are sewn together to make um, um two large sheets the sheets are joined together by means of loops and clasps and have the cherubim embroidered on them um the third one you now the sheets woven of goat hair are stretched like a tent over the sanctuary then the ram skins dyed colored with the red cover for the whole building and there are two veils what are the what are they first a veil over the entrance to the sanctuary verses 36 to 37 and there is a second veil which is more costly this splits the interior space between an outer area called the holy place and an area in the back the holy of holies no and behind the veil in the holy of holies which is the most sacred um, area stand 
the ark and the propitiatory verses 33-34 and this holy of holies is strictly reserved to Yahweh and in this holy place there is the menorah and the table of the show bread in verse 35 so from the tabernacle the writer turns to the surrounding sacred area the central object in the court was the altar of burnt offerings where the main sacrificial services took place on a regular basis uh, chapter 27 verses 1 to 2 describes about so 1 to 8 describe about the altar now think of our churches today altars are located inside the churches but in ancient Israel the altar was located outside the temple outside the temple building in a courtyard area but accessible to the people the altar is basically a hollow wooden box about 7.5 feet long 7.5 feet wide and 4.5 feet high plated with bronze it is difficult to understand how it operated since the heat from the from these whole burnt offerings would destroy the altar like to suggest a solution stones are placed on top of the altar for burning and the four corners of the altar are provided with the horns so the um, fire will not destroy the altar itself an offering for God could be brought to the altar and bound to its horns and I will show you the uh, pictures of uh, these ancient um, altars where there are four horns and these horns very significant because they were grasped by persons seeking asylum at the sanctuary and nobody can touch them if they are holding on to the horns of the altar the horn is the symbol of strength Yahweh's strength uh, there's a description in verse 18 of the elaborate courtyard for the desert sanctuary which is 150 feet long 75 feet wide and 7.5 feet high a barrier of bronze columns and silver curtain rods now these rods hold linen curtains they uh, set off the coat from all other areas I would like you to remember Ezekiel's vision that pictured the temple surrounded by a wall to separate the sacred from the profane Ezekiel 40 to 20 um, verse 20 to 21 chapter 27 uh, speaks about the oil oil for the lambs upon the seven branches of the lamb stand seven small clay lamps were set up to burn through the night the pure oil which is extracted by pounding the olives in a mortar rather than grinding and pass through a strainer is used for the sanctuary lamb so pure oil because they are the oil is used for a holy purpose this pure oil is to come from the people it is significant but 
this is to be handled by the priest the source is from the people the contribution from the people for the sacrifice but the sacrifice is performed by the priest the sanctuary light is intended to be a perpetual reminder of yahweh's presence in the desert sanctuary now we move to chapter 28 uh, that speaks about priestly vestments we, uh, i think some knowledge of the history of uh, priesthood is essential to appreciate this section priesthood proper appeared in late judaism because in chapter 12 120 there's a mention of the lack of priests for the passover but with the rise of monarchy two phenomena occurred first rival sanctuaries second increased centralization of the jerusalem temple both in first samuel chapter 2 second samuel chapter 15 um insistence of deuteronomic policy of one sanctuary that is in jerusalem priests serving country shrines were put out of work deuteronomy was very strict about it chapter 12 4 to 14 earlier there were many shrines but with the time of deuteronomy um one shrine one center one god one worship so many of these priests were who were descendants of levi later they became second class citizens they became a part of the charity of people together with the widow orphan and alien let's look at the text of uh, deuteronomy chapter 26 12 when you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year which is the year of tithing give to the Lev- levite the sojourner the fatherless orphan and the widow so that they may eat within your towns and be filled so levites also form part of the charity of the people of israel together with the widows orphans and foreigners the only legitimate priest in jerusalem were the zadokites those descended from the priest zadok from solomon's time the high priests were all zadokite priests they claimed their lineage from eliazar the third son of aaron first chronicles chapter 6 verse 3 to 8 now at the time of jesus only this zadokite priest were priest exercised the high priestly role in jerusalem the sadducees that you are familiar in the gospels they are the descendants of zadok now the levites become synonymous with the inferior cultic employees who were subordinate to the sons of zadok aaron's priest family was the preeminent priestly line you know the priestly tradition the priestly writer highlights the role of Aaron and the priestly role in the early in israelite history the tribe of levi became a priestly class but only Aaron will be given all the vestments of the priest the children of Aaron are only like assistants The book of Exodus gives importance to seven priestly attires. 
and we will speak of four important uh, attires. Four of these important items. First, Ephod, chapter 28, 6 to 14. This dress, Ephod, harks back to the early cultic practice at the central sanctuary of Shiloh. It is thought of a linen apron worn by a priest and used in connection with the sacred lot which they will be putting inside uh, this linen apron. In, um, we, if you look at uh, verse 30, the engraved stones on each shoulder piece, verses 9 to 12, symbolize the priest intercessory function on behalf of the 12 tribes in verse 29. Their names are written on um, and it's a continual remembrance before the Lord. In chapter 28 verse 29, in this way Aaron will carry the names of the tribes of Israel on the chest piece over his heart when he goes into the presence of the Holy of Holies. Thus, the Lord will be reminded of his people continually. This breast piece of decision in chapter 28 verse 13 to, uh, 15 to 30 is about uh, 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 the, um, a piece of cloth hanging from the shoulder is called the breast place of judgment a pouch a bag containing the sacred lots known as uh, urim and uh, tumim verse 30 urim and tumim they are the names of the objects being cast so these lots provide yes or no answers for those seeking oracles from the priests. So the priests might put the hand in the pocket and what they take, like a dice, uh, it, will um, it will have the answer either yes or no. In the first Samuel chapter 14, Saul inquires from God whether he should pursue the Philistines. The third attire is the blue robe of the effort in chapter 28, 31 to 34. This is a short garment. The blue robe of the effort was worn under the main effort. The bells were once used. They were thought to protect the priest from the demonic attack so that the priest may not die when he enters the holy place. Verse 35. Yeah. Bell will be sound so that he may not die. The bells remind the priest that they are in the holy place. The bell signify the priest seeks permission from the Lord to enter and come out of the holy place. And finally, the headpiece in verse 36 to 38. The headpiece, a rosette of pure gold fastened to a turban, symbolizes the, le the regal splendor of the priest. Um, which is shown in Ezekiel chapter 21. And there is an engraving, holy to the Lord, on the turban, reminds the people of Israel about their special relationship with uh, Yahweh. And uh, some of these can be seen in the pictures that will be posted. So, may the peace of the Lord be with you. Shalom. Thank you, Lord, for the gift and love of your sacred word. Open our hearts 
to put into practice that which you have revealed to us through your word. Amen.